All right, our first lecture, lecture 11.4, the spinal cord. Functions of the spinal cord. Introduction. The functions of the spinal cord are twofold. It provides spinal reflexes. It also serves as a conduit for nerve impulses to and from the brain. As far as spinal reflexes, they occur in gray matter of the spinal cord. Spinal reflex involves nerve pathways, which is the route traveled by a nerve impulse through the nervous system. And that impulse, a reflex arc, is the simplest demonstration of a nerve pathway. A reflex arc includes two or three neurons, it's an involuntary response, and it does not involve the brain. Examples of reflex arcs include knee jerks or patellar reflex, withdraw, example pulling your toe pulling your toe or your foot away when feeling attack on the floor you get that prick so that would be an example of a withdraw uh, response sneezing and blinking components of a reflex arc the components of a reflex arc include a sensory receptor which reacts to a stimulus and then you have a sensory neuron that conducts the afferent sensory impulse to the central nervous system the integration center, consisting one of two, one to several synapses in the central nervous system, is going to take that and send it to a motor neuron that conducts the efferent motor impulses from the central nervous system to an effector. And basically an effector is the muscle fibers or glands that respond to the motor impulse by contracting a muscle. So if you think about this, you have the afferent or sensory impulse that is going to the central nervous system and then you have the effector or efferent motor impulse that is coming out of the central nervous system and going to the effector which would be that muscle so if you if you uh, want to remember the path pathway think of effector exit so effector is going to exit that central nervous system so there are two uses of reflexes it is to ensure proper transmission of an impulse from sensory receptor through the nervous system to the effector, and it's also used to determine uh, tissue damage. The conduit for nerve impulse to and from the brain would be nerve tracts, and you have two types of nerve tracts. You have ascending and descending tracts. The white matter of the spinal cord represents the location of our major nerve pathways called nerve tracts, and it provides a two-way system of communication. First, in general, the ascending tracts are located posterior dorsal columns and conduct sensory or afferent impulses from body parts up to the brain. And then in general, the descending tracts are located anterior, anterior or in ventral columns and conduct motor efferent impulses from the brain down to effectors. The general characteristics of nerve tracts are basically most cross over, most consist of two or three successive neurons, and most exhibit somatotrophy. That is, the tracts from to upper body are located to the, on the outside and the tracts from to on the lower body are located on the inside and all pathways are paired left to right so if we look we have ascending tracts and that would be the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus this location is the posterior column and then anterior tract is in the anterior column the information carried will be touch pressure and movement the spinal thalamic tracts, the location lateral tract is in the lateral column, the anterior tract is in the anterior column, and the information carried by that ascending tract would be, um, as far as the lateral tract, pain and temperature, as far as the anterior tract, it would be touch and pressure. The spinal cerebellar tracts, the location anterior superficial lateral column and the posterior will be the posterior superficial lateral column. Information carried by the spinal cerebral tracts would include sensation of movement of lower limbs. As far as descending tracts, you have the corticospinal tracts 
the location there would be the anterior track in the anterior column and lateral tracks in the lateral column. Information carried, control of the skeletal muscles, the reticulospinal tracts, location anterior track and anterior column, lateral track and lateral column, the information carried there. Um, that would control muscle tone and sweat glands. And then you have the rubrospinal tract, which would be uh, located in the lateral deep column. And that, uh, that information carried would be the control of posture. So that is the spinal cord. 11.5, the brain. Introduction. It is the largest, most complex portion of the nervous system. The location, it occupies the cranial cavity. Its composition is 100 billion multipolar neurons. Its function is to oversee the entire body and also provides characteristics like emotions and personality. It's quite amazing. The brain is composed of four major portions. They include the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brain stem. Let's look at brain development first. So as far as brain development, embryonic neural tube is going to expand and hollows cranially. And then you have three vesicles develop. And these three vesicles are going to develop and split to become the four adult ventricles. The walls of these three vesicles become certain adult brain areas. You have the forebrain, which is going to develop into the cerebrum, basal nuclei, and diencephalon. You have the midbrain, which will develop into the midbrain. And you have the hindbrain, which is going to develop into the pons, medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. So we'll look at all these. Let's first look at the structure of the cere cerebrum. The cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain, which is divided into two cerebral hemispheres. Hemispheres are connected by the deep bridge of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. The surface ridges are called convolutions or gyri. Each hemisphere is divided into lobes, which are named for the bones that cover them, including the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. Convolutions are separated by two grooves. You have the sulci, which are shallow groove, and the central sulci, which is the frontal parietal, and the lateral sulci, which is the temporal and others. You also have things called fissures, and these are deep grooves. So fissures are deep convolutions, and you have the longitudinal fissure, which is going to separate the two cerebral hemispheres, and the transverse fissure, which is uh, basically going to separate the cerebrum and the cerebellum. As far as its composition, the bulk of the cerebrum is white matter, Bundles of myelinated nerve fibers carrying impulses from the cortex toward the spinal cord by oligodendrocytes. And then you have the cerebral cortex, or the outer portion of the cerebrum, which is composed of gray matter, which are the bundles of interneuron cell bodies. Functions of the cerebrum. The functions of the regions of the cortex. So the cerebral cortex is responsible for all conscious behavior. And you have three functional areas. You have the sensory area, association areas, and motor areas. Sensory areas. These are the primary cortex. It receives information from general receptors, that is temperature, touch, pressure, and pain. It is located in the post-central gyrus of the parietal cortex. The second sensory area would be the visual cortex area. This is the receives information from hearing receptors in the ear. Oh no, wait. The visual cortex area receives incoming information from photoreceptors in the retina of the eye, and it would be located in the occipital cortex. The third sensory area is the auditory area, and it's going to receive incoming information from hearing receptors in the ear, and that's located in the temporal cortex. 
And then you have the last sensory or area, which is the gustatory cortex. And that's going to receive information from taste receptors and taste buds of the tongue. And that's located in the parietal cortex just above the temporal lobe. The next will be association areas. Association areas of the cere cerebral cortex include, in general, includes areas that are not directly involved in motor or sensory function, and they are involved in many traits. The area is usually interconnected and involved in all four lobes. Association traits include analyzing and interpreting sensory experiences, and help provide memory, reasoning, verbalizing, judgment, and emotions. So those are all association areas. And then lastly, you have motor areas. Motor areas are located in the frontal cortex. You have uh, two basic areas. You have the primary motor cortex, which is going to initiate all voluntary muscle movements, and it's located in the gyrus just anterior to the central sulcus, or the precentral gyrus, and then you have Broca's area, and that's the area that's in involved with motor speech, and that's located in the left frontal lobe, above the temporal lobe. Um, this 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 area right here will play a, a big part if you're going on to school to become a speech pathologist. As far as brain uh, hemisphere dominance or brain lateralization. Most basic functions, sensory motor, are equally controlled by both left and right hemispheres. Um, communication is done through the corpus callosum. So some associative functions, one hemisphere has greater control over language-related activities, including speech, writing, and reading, mathematics, and logic. The area that has that major control would be your dominant hemisphere. For most people, it is the left hemisphere of the brain that is considered the dominant hemisphere, which would then make the right hemisphere or the non-dominant hemisphere the other part. And that would be the part that would control orientation in space, art, musical appreciation, and emotions. Memory. Memory is a consequence of learning. Learning is the acquisition of, of, of knowledge of new knowledge. Memory is the persistence of that learning with the ability to access it at a later time. And there are basically two types of memory. There are short-term memory and long-term memory. And we'll look at uh, article, an article related to short-term and long-term memory. Uh, basal nuclei. These are masses of gray matter located deep within the white matter of the cerebral hemispheres. It serves as a relay station for outgoing motor impulses from the brain, and it's going to release dopamine, which is going to inhibit excess movements. The diencephalon includes two important areas of gray matter. You have the thalamus, which is the central relay station for incoming sensory impulses, except for smell, and direct sensory impulse to appropriate area of the cerebral cortex for interpretation. You have the hypothalamus, which is the main visceral control center of the body. That is, it's going to help regulate homeostasis, such as heart rate and arterial blood pressure, body temperature, water and electrolyte balance, control of hunger and body weight, control of digestive movements and secretions, regulation of sleep-wake cycles, and control of endocrine system functions. You also have the limbic system, which is involved in emotional response. The limbic system also includes structures in the frontal and temporal cortex, basal nuclei, and deep nuclei. It controls emotional experience and expression, can modify the way a person acts, produces feelings of fear, anger, pleasure, and sorrow, and recognizes life-threatening upsets in a person's physical or psychological condition and encounters them and it is evolved in the sense of smell. The brain stem uh, we'll look at in our next lecture. So we'll look at the brain stem, which includes the midbrain pons, medulla oblongata, and we'll do some reticular formation. And then we'll end this chapter with a look at the uh, autonomic nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. 
And that will bring us to the end of our second chapter.